right, we're getting ready to get started. Well, let's worship God together. Bitch, why are you always playing that song? God love it. Y'all ready? Shut up. You don't feel like being in on this with me. Brother, stop you. Let's go. Yes, sir. started. Thank God for this opportunity. Pray for us. Let's roll with it and God get the glory today. Oh my goodness. Midday manna coming at you. Excited about it. Let's go.
Welcome, everybody. This is Bishop J. Charles Carrington, Jr. I'm the senior pastor of Life Builders Church, and you are tuned in today to Midday Manor. Midday Manor is a ministry, outreach ministry, of the Life Builders Church, Baltimore. I am the senior pastor, Bishop J. Charles Carrington, Jr., along with the help meet that God's given me, Pastor Althea Carrington, we pastor to me, the greatest church in the world, the greatest people, not putting down nobody else. But I once heard a great friend of mine, in fact, it was Bishop Jerome Stokes, my covenant brother, say that it would be a poor farmer who doesn't praise his own field. So I'm not a poor farmer. <laughs> Welcome one and all. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for your marvelous word. Thank you for your truth that exceeds our expectation. Your peace that passes all understanding. Your healing virtue, your keeping power, your love without fail, and your grace upon our lives. Thank you for keeping us from COVID-19, coronavirus. Thank you for keeping us from heart attacks, strokes, Lord, cancer, pulmonary embolisms, deep vein thrombosis, diabetes, Lord, any ailment whatsoever. Lord, you are Jehovah Rapha. And even now we pray for those that may be dealing with any of this. Show yourself strong. Be the strong tower that you are. Be the healer that you are. Lord God, be the strength giver that you are. Lord, we expect good reports. We expect favorable reports. Lord God, and anything less, we're going to continue to believe you until it changes for the better. So Lord, thank you. We want to call names, but you know those that we love so dear that are dealing with infirmities. And Lord God, dealing with sickness and disease, family members, non-family members, people of God. Lord, they're all in your hands. Now show yourself strong. Jehovah Rapha, show yourself strong. Now Lord, be glorified today in all that is said, done, seen and heard. And we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Beloved, I feel the Holy Ghost. I'm telling you, my God, I want to say a happy anniversary to my covenant brother and sister, uh, Pastor William Spence and uh, uh, Lady Kenya Spence. They are over in the Washington, D.C. area celebrating, I believe, their uh, seventh or their ninth. I I'm not sure, but they're celebrating their anniversary. <laughs> and uh, God has kept them and brought them and they have been married now, been a blessing. We love you dearly. Happy anniversary. Sister Kenya, actually Lady Kenya, is the one that shared Taka with me. I'm now 30 pounds down and uh, thanking God for that. Also thanking God for Brother Ed Milan, who has shared with me um, a, a, a powerful work of this patch system that repairs the body stem cells and uh, works through the body stem cells to restore youth, and restore uh, damaged cells. My knee had to give me so much trouble, but I'm able to walk on it better than I've ever been. Arthritis, nah, we thank God for destroying that. So those are two resources I told you I'm gonna talk about, and uh, I'm, they don't owe me no money, <laughs> but I am thankful these are products that I'm using to not just lose weight, with the taka, but also to regain all strength and vitality with the taka and with the live wave technology. And it's just blessing my life and my wife's life in a tremendous way. We'll tell you more about it. Ed Millard, this life wave is phenomenal. Lady Kenya, mm, this taka is phenomenal. And good to combine them both in addition to just living good, drinking good water, pH balance water, not drinking tap water. No offense, tap water for washing clothes. <laughs> but you want good water to put in your body. It's a good water to drink that uh, good water from, uh, you know, pH bottles. Don't let the sun get to it too much. But, you know, just spend a little money on yourself. The more you spend on yourself and product, the less you'll spend at the dock. I'm going to leave that right there. All right? Y'all ready for the word? Let's pick up our Bibles and let's declare together. Lord, I thank you that I have my Bible. 
It is my personal copy, a basic instruction before leaving earth. I am a believer, not a doubter. I'm not just a hearer, but I'm also a doer. And my life is so much better because I hear and obey the word of the living God. Therefore, I declare my mind is alert. My heart is receptive. I will not be distracted, but I will hear the word of the living God. And as a result of what I hear this day, I'm going to leave this experience better than I came to it. In Jesus' name, amen. Quickly with me, turn your Bibles to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 16. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 16. We've been studying about the proper image, the proper reflection, the proper perception, and our lesson has been developing the proper image. This has been not just for our impact groups, which are powerful on Wednesday nights. You want to be a part of that? Email us at lbcministry at yahoo.com. Email us at lbcministryyahoo.com. We'll send you the link so you can join with us every Wednesday evening, 730, for our impact groups. It is powerful, and God will bless you. Always a great word. And we teach the word, my God, and then the word is discussed. So tonight's word will be what we taught last week. Next week's Wednesday impact word will be what we're teaching today. So you're getting a precursor of it so you can learn it, study it, prepare questions, prepare input, because our impact groups are interactive, and they are truly what they are called, impact groups. So Matthew 16, we're talking about people of God having the right image. Um, without, I'm not throwing rocks at anybody. That's something my, my pastor says a lot. I'm zipping this up now. I just want to keep it up really neat, but if it go down again, it's staying. But my pastor uses the term, I'm not throwing rocks, and I've learned what it means because the other part of that statement, if you sit under Apostle Ivy Hilliard, I've been um, sitting under his tutelage, his leadership since 2006, 2006, and uh, he's my pastor, and I'm proud to say so, and uh, every pastor should have a pastor. If you're a pastor and don't have a pastor, you need a pastor. I'm a pastor's pastor. I'm a bishop. That's why I'm a pastor's pastor. Also, flow in the apostolic gifts. I'm a church planter. I'm a ministry um, ministry man of God going into territories. Sent for a specific purpose. I accept it. I'm running after it. And I'm pivoting in that place to do what God called me to do. I have no shame about it. Apostles ain't around today. Well, I wonder why people do that before we get into our message. And talk about what's no longer around, but the devil is still the devil. <laughs> if God didn't want apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers to be around today, then why would the devil still be around? <clears throat> I, I want you to think about that. <clears throat> we have people that um, are heavy into sensationalist doctrine. Talking about what ended, what isn't, what is not needed. When, again, Satan is our enemy, not God's enemy. Why would God diminish us in our fight against the enemy and let gifts cease? Let prophets no longer be necessary. Let apostles have died out with the first century. Let the Holy Ghost not be necessary to be filled with. I mean, why, why would God do such a thing? When Satan is our enemy, trying to destroy us and tear us apart, we need everything that God has to offer. We need the Holy Ghost. Yes, we do. I believe in the power of the Holy Ghost, speaking with tongues as the Spirit gives utterance, not for impressing you, not with a bunch of foolishness, <coughs> excuse me, but the power of God working in me. We'll talk about tongues again. We've taught on the Holy Ghost. And the Holy Ghost is not tongues. <coughs> Excuse me. But the Holy Ghost, my God, is the power of God. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead that dwells in us. That's another lesson. But we need everything God got. And we need to live having the proper image. 
So from the New King James, I read these verses out of St. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 16. All right? Starting at verse 13, I read, When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I am? Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? So they said, Some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. Jesus said unto them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, God have mercy, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed are you, Simon bar Jonah, Simon, son of Jonah. Whenever you see that bar in front of a name, it means son of. Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood have not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I say also, say to you that you are Peter, Petros, rock. And on this rock, I will build my church, not on Peter, but on the rock of revelation of understanding and that the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Yes, Peter was the first preacher, my God, outside of Jesus and John the Baptist. Peter preached in the church. Peter declared Jesus used him to get Things started on the day of Pentecost. But beloved, Jesus will always be the rock. He was Daniel's rock hewed without hands. He is still the rock of our salvation. Don't get it twisted. Peter's a vessel. Jesus is the Lord God Almighty and the head of his church. So, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood, you're blessed because flesh and blood have not revealed this to you but my Father who is in heaven. And I say unto you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Gates don't move to come after us. We move and offend the gates. The gates of hell can't stand against us. My God, and I will give you the keys, the authority of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. God have mercy. Then he commanded his disciples that they should go and not tell no man what he was, who he was, that he was Jesus the Christ. From that time, Jesus began to show to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things, verse 21, from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. Then Peter messes up took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, talking out of emotions and not talking purpose. Thou shalt not happen. This shall not happen to you. But Jesus turned and said unto me to get behind me, Satan, for ye are an offense to me, for you do not savor, or nor you are, nor are you mindful of the things of God, but of the things of men. Ah. What a word, what a word, what a word, what a word, what a word. Now, beloved, look at this. We've been talking about image, having the proper image. And you can't have an image properly if you don't know who you are. I would dare say that poor self-worth, poor self-value, poor self-evaluation. What do you mean by that? Am I greater than God? Am I greater than the work of God? No. But unless you know who you are, then others can come and define who you are. Hmm. The power to define is the power to control. Good or bad. Good or bad. Can I say that again? The power to define is the power to control. Good or bad. I don't mind being under the Holy Ghost control because the Bible is clear. Jesus said through Peter, in fact, that we are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. My God, I am his beloved. 
John declares, beloved, now are we the sons of God. It might not appear what we're going to be, but we do know this. When he appears, we shall be like him and we shall see him as he is. Then he goes on to say, everyone that has his hope in himself purifies himself even as he is pure. So, beloved, you know, if I don't know who I am, if I don't know whose I am, then Satan can come in and tell me all kinds of foolishness and jack my life up. Yeah, I said it. Jack my life up. I mean, jack it up like one time real quick. And this is no dispersion against New York. Congratulations on your new mayor uh, for, for, for New York, one of the barrels. Uh, congratulations to you. But um, rule well, serve well. But I was in New York one time on a field trip years ago in middle school, I believe. And uh, one of the greatest trips we had <laughs> in, in field trips. And uh, I remember I went up, we took up the bus, went up to New York, and we rode by a car. Had the tires on it, had everything on it. And we were going to see a play on Broadway. When we came out of that play and the bus rolled back by, that tires were gone. All four cars sitting up on cinder blocks. This was in like you know the late seventies, I think. May no, no, the early seventies. I was in eighth grade in middle school, and I remember that distinctly. God have mercy. Whoa, it was horrible, and I felt so bad for the person who owned that car. All four tires gone, not just the rubber, but the wheels sitting up on cinder blocks. So what did I say that for? <laughs> because, beloved, the enemy comes to steal identities. You talking about identity theft? When a believer don't know who they are, they'll fall prey to who everybody and everything else tells them they are. When a believer has understanding of who they are, then nobody can take away from them. Not only who they are, but what their purpose is. God, I feel like talking about this today. So we read this text in Matthew chapter 16, and, and, and one of the things that I want to get across from the outset is what is thought from those who are on the outside or by those who are not directly related, connected to, or in covenant with, is shaped by the following, my reputation. My image is shaped by the following. I'm going to say these slow and more than once. Number one, associations. Who I hang around. Birds of a feather. Want to be wise? Walk with the wise. Number two, my activities. What do I do with my time? What do I do with my time? My appearance. How do I reflect myself? Not only how I dress, but my appearance, how I carry myself. Opinions of others, number four, talks about image, reflection, and perception. The opinions of others. Number, number that was, let's see, that was number four. And number five, the perception of others. How do I make people feel? I mean, am I arrogant? Am I brash? Am I softly? Am I weakling? How do I come off? Then there's the image that I portray. Is it an image all about me? Is it an image all about what I got to offer? Am I saying later for everybody else? Nobody matters but me. Nobody's more important than me. Nobody's important at all. What kind of image do I portray? Am I humble? You know, I hate to sound like a homer, but I got to put my plug in for my boy Lamar Jackson. Reason why I know he's going so far in his career and going to do very well. I'm praying this is the year he gets the Super Bowl, the first of many, I believe. But I believe one of the reasons why he is so popular is because of his humility. Lamar is one of the baddest players in the NFL. 
but he don't carry it like I'm the man, I'm the man, I'm going to kick your tail. I'm the man, I'm the man, I'm going to kick it well. <laughs> That's not Jamal, uh, Lamar. That's not Lamar. In most of his interviews, I'm not saying he's a saint, but most of his interviews that I see, he said you got to keep God first. Keep God first. Well-grounded young man. Thank God for him. But, beloved, he portrays an image of humility. Humility. Unfortunately, many fail to realize this awesome truth. It is one's personal perception of themselves that directly, hear me, affects their visibility, how people see you, and also how you see. As well, it affects your reputation, because reputation is always defined as what others think of you. It reflects the image that you portray and perception of others of that image. Now, as we think reputation, image and perception are not important to the success of the ministry. That's a lie. <laughs> oh, it's all about the anointment. It ain't about how we treat people. You just come on in our church, dance, dance, shout, run the aisles and run some laps. You can leave out of here and live like you want as long as we have some good service. Some good service. Some good service. Oh, can I just throw this in there? I'm hoping that we all get the revelation as we come out of pandemic that you don't go to church for service unless you're working. But even that, everything in the church is worship. So you don't go to service, you go to worship. Sunday morning worship. Saturday worship, Friday night sabbatical worship, a Sabbath worship is worship, not service. Hmm. I hope people get that. I, I'm not trying to change. There ain't no new doctrine. You serve outside the doors of the church, but you worship inside. Everything inside the church should be considered worship. Just my little five cents on that. Uh, where you get that from? Because God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Whenever you see service mentioned or talked about, it's being done to feed the, but to feed the hungry, clothe the naked, help the widow. That's, that's true religion, according to what the word says. That's service. Okay, Helping people can't help themselves. But I don't want to digress. Let's make sure that we have the proper image. Okay? Because the image of the church is most important. The reputation of the ministry is most important. The perception of the ministry is most important. I've heard, I've been in church all my life. I haven't been saved all my life. There's a big difference. I've been around church. I am a third generation preacher. Okay? Both my grandfathers were preachers. My father, although I pastored him, is a preacher, was a preacher. You know, I served them. And I am looking at the fact that I've seen this in the church. So unfortunate. So unfortunate. How in the church, people have been mean as snakes. From the parking lot to the pulpit, people have been diametrically opposed to good manners have been diametrically opposed to treating people with respect and dignity. Listen, everybody that comes to the house of God for worship, you don't know what they came through to get there. Why should they have to bypass your means? Because you had an argument with your husband or your wife or yourself before you came to worship. No one should have to have that experience of dealing with you, but you should get yourself together. See, this is something I want to say about image. You know, I strive myself as a pastor over the years. And I know some people have not understood it. Some have definitely not liked it. I'm not looking for perfect people to serve, but I'm looking for mature people to serve. You should be able to pray for yourself. You should be able to pray for yourself, pray for yourself, and pray for your family, Pray that you be delivered, or if you don't know how to do that, 
Find somebody to help you do it. You don't bring your problems to the house of God. What is it like, okay, me and my wife argue Sunday morning horribly, calling names, throwing pots, which we don't do. Just use it as an example. And um, I come to church, bless you, everybody. God bless you. Hallelujah. That's phony, that's false, that's fake. Before I come before you, I got to go before God and get right with my wife and vice versa. I mean, there's so many who think if I just come to church, it's all right. Beloved, if you're serving in the house of God, you're worshiping. You're standing, look at here, between somebody's encounter with God, okay? If you're worshiping, if you're serving in God's house, you're worshiping. You are sometimes the only person that will encounter that person, and you must encounter them the right way. Mean parking lot attendants, folk talking in any kind of way. I, mean, I went to this particular car place, and I need a little air in my tire. The guy took the air holes out, took it a foot, picked it up and dropped it, say, there you go. Did not volunteer to put air in my tire. Did not know I was going to give him some bucks. But no, he ain't getting no bucks from me. It's a reality. Customer service is so important, even in the house of God. The image we portray. Are the bathrooms smelling like urine or are they smelling lemony fresh? <laughs> I'm serious. It might be funny, but it's so true. I mean, male and female bathrooms. God have mercy. Is that the odorizer for us who need it? After we're done making deposits. Bishop, you crude. No. Image. Is someone cleaning the house of God? Now we have to sanitize it. Now we got to have hand sanitizer. We have to have fresh masks. Have to have people with the right attitude. Who takes temperatures at the door. Now, come in and give me that. You show that thing in their head, you know. We got to have people that present the proper image of Christ. Now, this is the one thing that should be every church's moniker, every church's identifier. We all represent Christ. We all point people to Christ. So regardless of whatever church you go to, now, I always say, if every church in Baltimore, where I'm from, is full every Sunday morning, there'll still be people outside needing to come. So I don't need to fight nobody over members. I mean, if you leave a church, leave rightly, properly. If you said God sent you there, then at least have the, the, uh, the courtesy to say God told you go elsewhere. And make sure it's God, okay? Not your flesh, not your emotions. But beloved, you know, we represent Christ in every church planted by the hand of God. There ought not be no mean ushers. I would challenge you. Pastor, since I'm a bishop, let me exercise a supervisory authority and suggest that you remove mean ushers. Remove mean pocket lighters. I don't care how long they've been on an Irsha board. They mean they don't need to serve. If they can't mature themselves and know how to talk to people and know how to get people, even sometimes you might, as an usher, and I've seen this, uh, tell somebody, you know, sit here. Please. And you guide them. They say, I don't want to sit there. And they act ugly. I've seen gifted, anointed, talented, mature ushers diffuse the situation. Because that's how they are. So, beloved, we got to present the right image of the house of God to those who are seeking. And I know many might say, I shouldn't be worried about what people think. Shucks. They, they, they can put their pants on likely. Listen. When you serve in God's house, you're worshiping. Those are worshiping pants. And you got to represent God properly. Oh, let me not stay on that too long. But I just wanted to take that opportunity to call the church to a greater level of service and maturity because we're presenting the image of Christ, not the image of First Baptist Church of uh, Ahasuerusville, not the image of First Pentecostal Church of Porktown. No, we are the church of Jesus Christ. Our image is everything. Who's at your door? 
Who's in your parking lot? Who's cleaning your bathrooms? Who's vacuuming the carpet of the sanctuary in the classrooms? Who's sanitizing? I mean, I, I, I love the smell of spikenard. That's the odor that Jesus, not odor, the aroma, I'm sorry, odor is negative. Aroma is positive. That's the aroma that Jesus emanated as he was being uh, crucified. You know, the woman broke the alabaster box full of spikenard, pulled it all on his hair, poured it all over him, anointing him for his burial. We come to church to worship God. On Sundays, we come to worship because Sunday being the first day of the week, Jesus rose on the first day of the week. We come to celebrate that. You find often in the New Testament church, the people were together on the first day of the week. You worship on Saturday. It's the Sabbath. You want to come together and worship, contemplate, worship, reflect. My God, the Bible says, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. You want to worship on Friday night when the Sabbath begins. My God, every time we come together is worship. And we remember that we reflect Christ, not doctrine, not meanness, not denomination. Christ. Hmm. So, beloved, Jesus asked the question, because that's the focus. He is, not us. Jesus asked the question. Are y'all hearing me today? Jesus asked, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? He asked that question of his disciples in our text in John, uh, Matthew sorry, 16, 13 to 23. And the disciples begin to give different answers. Some say, some say, some say. Very important question. Why was it so important? Because Jesus wanted to know what they knew of his reputation. I mean, honestly. He was concerned about how he was coming across outside of the sphere of his influence. If Jesus can be concerned about that, what's up with us? He wanted to know, what are people saying about me? Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? So get this point. If Jesus is concerned about image, reputation, he's God. If he's concerned about perception, we ought to be as well. Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Then he moves to the next question, which was the most important for us to follow Christ. He asked, but who do you say that I, the Son of Man, am? Now, I've heard what other people say about me. What do you say about me? I want y'all to understand this. Perception is the one issue that either thrusts us into greatness or confines us to mediocrity. There could be somebody watching you, watching a ministry. You know, in a few weeks, you're going to see changes to outset. Because I want to come across the best I can. Thank God for this backdrop. Very, very nice backdrop. It's the logo of our church. Got information. We'll use it elsewhere. You get ready to see a new set. It's being worked on as we speak. I just won't show it to you. New upgrade in sound and lighting. Because we want to be on properly, even as we are in the building. We still want a proper image. Because there may be somebody watching who may be saying, I want to serve the Lord. They may have a meticulous character. They may have a meticulous uh, personality. I'm not just trying to cater stuff to you, but I definitely don't want to turn nobody off because we're half shod, raggedy, tore up from the floor, looking bad. God deserves better than that. So your perception of yourself will either thrust you into greatness or confine you to mediocrity. How you see yourself. How you present yourself. How you show who God is to you. Listen, one of the biggest things, if God ain't good to us as believers, and a sinner man see that, they're going to be saying, well, if God ain't good to them, he ain't going to be good to me. And I'm here to tell you God is good to me. As 
It's not about material, although thank God for what he gives us. My perspective is material blessings are payment for obedience. And if I'm paid well, I obey well. That's the way I see it. But it's not about material because wind can blow my house down. <laughs> Hurricane can come and wash it away. Oh, yes. Mm. My car can get hit. Dent it up. Frame bent. Total. So what I have in terms of material is not the sole or singular indication of God's goodness to me. How am I presenting my life as a believer is that indication. Am I making God shine? Am I making God proud? Or am I being a hindrance to somebody? I got to get ready to close. But beloved, in order for visibility of a believer's life to be accurately transmitted and received. Hear my words. Perception of ourselves by ourselves must be correct, strong, and biblically sound in the following areas. Catch this, and we're closing. What is your perception of Jesus? Because that's who we're reflecting. Oh, he's just a man upstairs. There's more than that. Oh, he's just a big God that just answers my prayer. And sometimes he do, sometimes he don't, depending on how he feels. That's a lie. God is good all the time. And we need to reflect his goodness. Because it is the goodness of the Lord that leads to repentance. Yeah, change of heart and mind. What is your perception of your leadership in your local church? Hmm. Because folk won't come to your church let alone come to Jesus if you're not reflecting properly. What is your perception of the ministry you're involved in? Not just the church you go to, but if you're an usher, how do you perceive that? As service in the house of God, which is worship, or just something to do? In closing, what is your perception of yourself? Often people present things wrongly, poorly, because their perception of themselves is poor. It's poor. Hmm. Shall I say that again? People often present things wrongly because the perception of themselves is poor. But I'm going to close on this note, but I want to define perception once again. Hear me, I'm going to say it more than once. Perception is defined as recognition or understanding of, insight into, to hear, attend to, or to be knowledgeably aware of, to regard as, to possess keen insight into, so as to better appreciate or be aware of or reflect proper awareness. Can I say that again? Perception, recognition, or understanding of, insight into. You notice the Bible tells us husbands, dwell with your wives according to knowledge. You want a happy wife, understand her. You may not know everything you need to know, but study her, understand her. I've been married almost 38 years and I'm still studying. There are things I know, but there are things about my 20-year-old wife that my mm -mm year old wife has changed. <laughs> so I got to study her at every level. Come on. Perception, recognition of understanding of, insight into, to hear, attend to, or to be knowledgeably aware of, to regard as, to possess keen insight into, so as to better appreciate or be aware of or reflect. So as we close, Jesus asked the question, who do men say? that I, the Son of Man, am. Now I want you to drop down when you get some time and read these last texts. I want you to read prior to the, the 16th chapter. I want you to go back to the 13th chapter of Matthew and read verse 53 through 58. And this message lesson text will become clearer to you as you develop a better perception.
Beloved, I close on this note. You got to see yourself properly. You got to see yourself as a servant of God, child of God, royal priesthood, holy nation, peculiar people, all of that. All of that. And serving God with y'all. Do that. And God will be glorified. Father, I've done what you told me. I've spoken what you told me. I've spoken what you said. The Lord, you arise and every enemy be scattered. Thank you for taking us out of self. And Lord, we always want to be used for someone else. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. In case there's someone that doesn't know Jesus tuning in today, let me tell you, he is the best thing that ever happened to me. I pray that I'm representing him good to you because he's been good. Better than good. Oh, I'm getting emotional because he's been so good. So good. And I thank him for who he is to me. Everything I got, he gave me. Everything I am, he made me. Everything that I'm doing, he's empowered me to do for his glory. I can't sit up here and take credit for nothing. No thing. I love it with every fiber of my being. Beloved, I want to introduce you to him today if you don't know him. I could have you repeat after me, but beloved, I want you to say it yourself. Lord, I need you. That's what I need you to say. Come on, say that. I guarantee you, he's going to come to your aid. He's going to come to your rescue. If you say that, Lord, I've sinned. I'm in sin. I can't get out of it by myself. That's why you came. You lived, bled, and died for me and rose again to deliver me from sin. 1 John 3 and 8 said, For this purpose was the Son of God manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. The greatest works of the devil is the work of sin and iniquity. Jesus destroyed that work for you. And you need to just come to him and let what he's done change your life. <laughs> let it change your life. Beloved, I got to go. Man, I wish I had more time. But beloved, I want you to come to Jesus. If today you are saying to the Lord, I want to be saved, we have three ways to contact us. We'll help you. Phone number 443-776-0255. Phone number 443-776-0255. Somebody's waiting to get your call. If the line's busy or tied up, I promise we'll call you back. Leave a message. We'll call you back. Email LBC Ministry, LBC Ministry, singularly, at Light Builders Church. That's what we call it, LBC Ministry, at yahoo.com. LBC Ministry at yahoo.com. You can email us. We'll answer you back, I promise. Then there's our website, www.lbcbaltimore.org www.lbcbaltimore.org Again, website. www.lbcbaltimore.org mm -hmm. Email LBC Ministry LBC Ministry at yahoo.com Ministry, singular. M-I-N-I-S-T-R-Y LBC Ministry at yahoo.com then last but not least, our phone number, 443-776-0255. That's 443-776-0255. Love, we got to go, but I want you to receive our contact information. Feel free to utilize it because we're here for you. We're here for you. All right? This is Bishop G. J. Charles. Bishop J. Charles. J. Charles Carrington Jr. On behalf of my wife, Pastor Althea, on behalf of all the officers and partners of Life Builders Church, we say to you, have a wonderful day. Join us Sundays, 10 a.m. on these same venues, and you watch God do something powerful in your life. We thank God for you, beloved. Let God arise, and every enemy be scattered. We're here for you. God bless. What great Christian smooth jazz. Thank you, Lord, for saving me. You are my perfect peace. You are my perfect peace. You are my perfect peace. Wherever I go, go with me. You are my perfect peace. My body and soul, you feel me.
All righty. Beloved, thank you for hanging in there with me today. I appreciate you. Thank you for praying. Thank you for staying. Thank you for standing. Thank you for thank you, thank you, sake. You're good. You're wonderful. And I love you all. Have a great day. God bless.